maybe time for me to bring in uh, Mr. Cook. Um, uh, your perspective on what's happening with Sri Lanka in Sri Lanka and maybe your expectations from partner countries like India. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation to join you on this platform today. It is extremely timely. And why do I say it is timely? You and I can choose our neighbors. Countries can't. We have to work with our neighbors. We have to ensure that we're going to be on very solid ground with our neighbors. And this is where Sri Lanka, whenever we have veered away from the path, have learned lessons from the past. And going forward, this is where Sri Lanka realizes the importance of a country like India. In the current context, when you look at what is happening in our country, on the island, we are having a severe foreign currency crisis that is uh, hitting us. It has already been explained. Uh, we are facing a fuel crisis. We are facing a power crisis. We are facing shortages of food, of essentials. I'm not talking about luxury items here, but there have been queues to obtain things like rice, sugar, milk powder, the list goes on. These are some of the basic essentials of day-to-day -day life when people uh, are going through extreme hardships. Power cuts, we are having at the moment seven and a half hour power cuts on a daily basis. Uh, thankfully, today we had a ship calling over at the Colombo port, which is being paid for, which is being, which is unloading right now, hopefully, and we are going to see some kind of respite. But this is very much short term. The whole country is facing a national crisis owing to the power uh, issue, the fact that there's not enough fuel and there's not enough foreign currency to buy the fuel, so they're all connected. Uh, but of course, when it comes to applying out a rollout of a power cut across the country, that has not been seen, that has not been experienced. Places like Colombo are not experiencing a power cut while the rest of the country goes through seven and a half hours. Now, this is something that could be deemed uh, rather inappropriate, uh, given the fact that Colombo consumes so much of power. And we need to be looking at alternate arrangements of either going into a shortened working week, uh, if we feel that it is um, the state sector that requires it, it might be even cheaper at that point for us to close institutions on another day of the week, a Saturday, a Sunday and a Monday or maybe on a Friday, so that we have a shortened week in order to try to save some of the reserves that we already have within the country. Uh, and this is where I say the country needs assistance and we need support and we need it immediately. Countries like India have come forward. Uh, it has been already mentioned just in January this year, we had 400 million currency swap. Uh, we've had a deferment of a payment of $500 million. Uh, it must be coming to a point where India must be getting tired of having calls coming from Sri Lanka uh, seeking assistance. Uh, but we are actually bereft of much choice. Sri Lanka turns to India at all of these points uh, and also to countries like China. Ambassador Chakrabarti also brought up China at that point um, where we are asking. We are asking China, we are asking India and they continue to give us. India continues to give us and China continues to give us. When we seek assistance, we sought assistance from Bangladesh, we received that too. Now, in the long run, Sri Lanka, of course, is increasing our debt burden by leaps and bounds. But then that's to be expected. Sector. This is a part of the times that we are living in. Governor Cabral also talked about the pandemic, the impact it has had, the drop in tourism, how this has impacted us. Uh, but this is also where we need to be looking at other options. We need to be looking at other alternatives. There is certain resistance in going to the IMF due to the conditions being set. But we also understand that the IMF sets those conditions because lenders want to be repaid. They want to ensure that whatever money they are doling out is going to come back to them at some point and we're not going to default. And of course, we have a good track record of having stood by our um, loans, whatever we've taken, we've always made efforts to repay them, as we saw even earlier this year. So we actually have much more flexibility from friendlier countries. And this is where countries like India come on board. Now, it is great that countries like India are helping us in the short term. But what we should really be focusing on now is the long term. Where are we going? How are we going to strategize for the future? And this is where India has that experience. India has been at this um, game for a very long time, uh, maybe just a few months longer than Sri Lanka has, considering times of independence. But of course, Sri Lanka, India has been able to make massive progress, given the size of the country, the diversity within the country. And this is where we need long term solutions. And one of the critical areas that we should be focusing on when it comes to India and Sri Lanka and our relations is on energy. I want to lead on to uh, what Ambassador Chakrabarti mentioned in terms of reserves, but I'm also going a step further in talking about energy, where, for example, solar power in India. India is uh, a fast developing, it's, it's fast developing industry over there. India has achieved targets for 2022 well ahead of time. 
India ranks third in renewable energy uh, country attractive index for 2021. The list goes on. I mean, India has achieved massive progress, uh, being the fifth largest solar installed capacity in the world, fourth largest installed capacity of renewable energy in the world. India is also the fourth largest capacity for wind power in the world. These are the areas that we need to be moving into. Fuel prices are going up globally. These are things that we are going to have to face. These are challenges we are going to have to face. We need homegrown solutions. We need to be looking at options within countries. We need to be overcoming whatever challenges we have from certain sectors, like we do in Sri Lanka, who are resisting such change. For decades, governments have been trying to move into renewable energy, look at greener options. But there has been resistance. These are challenges that we have to overcome. And this is where India can play a very big role in terms of sharing technology in helping Sri Lanka in the long term. Uh, and I say this for several reasons as well. It is in India's interest to see stability on the island. Very often we have talked about it in the past. We have seen Sri Lanka getting closer to countries and this has damaged bilateral connectivity to some extent, but we've able to revive it. The relationship is very resilient but we must not keep testing it. We must always move forward in the belief that we are going to strengthen it that much further. Sri Lanka is also conscious of the presence uh, of a country like India, its technological prowess, the way it has been able to do that. And at no point, when, especially when it comes to policy formulation, has Sri Lanka been able to successfully veer away from India. India remains a cornerstone in policy formulation, whether people like it or not when it comes to formulating policy in Sri Lanka, especially foreign policy. We've got to be very mindful of that. Very often, when we look at examples around the world, we see so many situations where we talk about sovereignty, we talk about equality, we talk about countries being on the same level. It doesn't always play out that way. We've got to understand that there's a power ladder and we sit at different positions or we stand on different rungs of this power ladder. These are things that these are realities that we've got to accept. And some of the realities we are seeing in the world today are because we have not accepted certain realities that exist around us. And this is where going forward, this is where India has the potential for short term support and also very importantly, long term. Going one step further, if I may, into the multilateral arena, this is where we need much deeper and much wider collaboration. And I just use three organizations. BIMSTEC has already been discussed. Sri Lanka is the current chair of BIMSTEC. There's a lot more that should be done. We're about to hand over the chairmanship in just a short period of time. But of course, the pandemic intervened. We lost out on a golden opportunity of steering dialogue, of focusing on those main priority areas within BIMSTEC. Sri Lanka has expertise. We, I, we can go into a totally new area there in terms of talking about countering terrorism. 12 years after the end of terror on our soil, Sri Lanka should be out there as a country that countered terrorism, explaining to the world ways and means through which we were able to do it. Instead, we are being forced onto a position of having to defend our position. This is because we are not writing our narrative. There are, these are wonderful opportunities for us to be writing our narrative and not allowing others to dictate narratives that we've got to then respond to. This is what we are seeing happening on the world stage today. If you look at a grouping like Iora, Sri Lanka has taken over as vice chair recently. This is where the Indian Ocean Rim Association extends in its uh, scope. It's bringing together countries which have wide potential, wide opportunities, much more collaboration. India and Sri Lanka as neighboring countries. This is where we should be looking at the synergy of working together within organizations of this nature. And a third grouping I want to mention is the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. India has become a full member of the SCO. Sri Lanka has been a dialogue partner since 2009. Now, we were the first dialogue partner to get involved in the SCO when they first started taking dialogue partners on board, and we are still a dialogue partner. This is where Sri Lanka needs to escalate onto a level of being a full member. Because when we talk about the Asian century, when we are going forward, the Asian century is not going to be achieved by China alone. There's going to be partnership with India. There's going to be partnership with other countries across Asia. We talk very often about issues, problems, concerns in Asia. These are highlighted by certain segments of the world, certain quarters of the world. But of course, we need to realize the potential of us getting together, us going forward. 
we talk when we look at Sri Lanka and India in particular, we talk about democracy. But I'm reminded of the words of um, the former Sri Lankan president, Jaya Jayabardhana, uh, who said democracy cannot survive on a diet of words. This is where people require food, he said, for their stomachs. They need clothing for their bodies and they need roofs over their heads. He made this statement in 1984 during a state visit to Washington on the lawns of the White House. And this is where we need to be taking democracy onto a much higher level because democracy has a lot of openings for strengthening the process, but it can also be weakened. And we do not want to go down that road at the end of the day. Um, uh, thank you so much. Uh, some of the international uh, multilaterals you've mentioned, BIMSTEC and, and IORA and Shanghai Cooperation Organization, as well as some of the more long-term reforms that you talk about. Uh, I suppose the challenge is that these re uh, regional organizations are not economically focused. And whereas some of the more long-term challenges that you're talking about are economically focused, these are reforms that Sri Lanka has to do within its own borders, just like India has to do in many cases, it has to do reforms for its own public sector enterprises and agriculture. The question becomes, how do we, how does, how can India help? It becomes very difficult, but how can any other country help with Sri Lanka's domestic reforms process? Uh, or the second question would be, if you expect these international regional organizations, how can we make them more economically oriented? So either way, it seems like uh, it becomes challenging for, um, for uh, a partner country to help. On to that first point, on to your first question, how can, Sri, how can India get involved in assisting Sri Lanka domestically? This is where we need the experience and expertise of India. India has transitioned. India has been able to adopt various policies. Of course, Sri Lanka opened our economy long before India. We've been adopting certain policies long before India. We can argue that on several lines. But India has been able to implement a very successful model. Now, that is something that we need to learn from. That is something we need to grasp. Whether we talk about the sector of energy, whether we're talking about economic cooperation, whether we're talking about bouncing back from tourism, um, um, backward trends, backward slides, whatever it may be, India has been able to do it very successfully. This is what we need to be exploring. This is what we need to be talking about. And if you go on to the international platforms, one thing that we have learned and one thing that we're experiencing right now is that trade, economic connectivity averts war averts the outbreak of uh, any kind of violence. You don't want to trade with, you don't want to fight with the person you're trading with. You're going to lose all those opportunities. Trade is a huge binding factor. This is where we need to be pushing for this way more in Iora, for example, looking at how the Indian Ocean Rim countries can intensify, come together, look at the potential of us working together. You know, we're always relying on this equation of North-South collaboration. What about South-South? We we talked about this very much in the 60s, 70s and 80s. We need to be returning to some of those principles and values because they held a lot of um, weight. We need to be re-examining those areas. Fair this enough. is where the positive factor about globalization is it has made us rely so much on each other that we are not able to. If you look at some of the countries in Europe that are highly dependent on Russia, they are hesitant right now to some extent because they're getting so much of their energy from Russia. You see how this trade has become such a positive factor. It's a, an amazing factor which we need to be looking 